uh, our first participant, uh, Professor uh, Arne Segelke, is ready. Are you ready? Yes. Um, we, we can start. I would like to introduce you with a couple of information about your, uh, your interests. Uh, so, um, uh, Dr. Arne E. Segelke studied history, uh, art history and uh, Scandinavian studies at the University of Freiburg, Kiel and Hamburg before joining a junior research group on transnational media events at the University of Gießen in Germany and completing his doctoral studies at the Humboldt Universität in Berlin. He joined the University of Greifswald as a postdoctoral researcher, so-called Wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter, at the chair of Nordic history in 2019, after working some years in the field of international adult education in both Germany and the Caucasus. Uh, among his uh, publications uh, closely related to this period of 1918 1921, he will uh, tell us about uh, in a couple of minutes. We should mention uh, his monography, uh, Deutsche und Britische Propaganda in Dänemark während des Ersten Weltkriegs, so German and British Propaganda in Denmark during the First World War, was published in Berlin in 2019. Uh, and uh, also I uh, would like to mention an, uh, a chapter uh, he published uh, uh, ten years ago, um, the memorialization of the 9th of November 1918 in the two German states, uh, which was published in a volume edited by Bill Lieven and Chloe Paver, uh, the title Memorialization in Germany since 1945. The memory aspect uh, in the, uh, let's say, the, the, the strengthening and the, the Reactivating sometimes, reactivation of a co collective emotion, as I told uh, you, is something quite important. So uh, that's why also I wanted to mention his publication. Uh, the title of uh, Mr. of, of Dr. Siegelke's presentation, exact title you have it on the program, is Politics of Fear, German Diplomacy and Border Disputes in, in the Baltic Sea Region, 1918-1921. Uh, well, uh, it's already well, almost 3 p.m., so right now our time discipline is exact. Uh, Arne, uh, if you're ready, the floor is yours. I just go on mute. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for accepting um, the paper proposal and inviting me to the conference. Now I'll try to share the presentation with you. I have a small presentation with a few pictures and um, maps, of course, when it comes to the topic of borders. So I think you can now, yes, you should see. Yes, it's great. We see. It's great. Yes. We yes, see yes, you, yes. we see you, and we see the presentation. Perfect. Um, the title of my presentation is Politics of Fear, German Diplomacy and Border Disputes in the Baltic Sea Region 1918 till 1921. And in my presentation, I would like to discuss two aspects of border fear. The first one, border fear as fear of losing claims over a border or border territory. And the second one, border fear as fear of losing control over a border or border territory. The main focus will be on the western fringe of the Baltic Sea region with the german danish border dispute as one of the long-running border conflicts between Prussia, Germany and one of its neighboring states in the Baltic Sea region and on the time between 1918 and 1921, as you know, a period marked by war, by conflict and struggle, by border shifts and the creation of new borders in the Baltic Sea region. The background of this conflict is marked by the difficulty of transforming a feudal concept of territory and borders to a national concept of territory and borders. At the beginning of the 19th century, the two duchies of Schleswig and Holstein, we see them on the map here, 
uh, Holstein on the right hand side of the slide uh, forms the lower part of the Cimmerian Peninsula and Schleswig is um, located north of Holstein. These two duchies were both fiefdoms of the Danish king and tied to the Danish crown in a late medieval feudal construction as part of the multicultural Danish Heilstaat that also included Norway, for example. As Duke of Holstein, the Danish king was vassal to the German emperor and Holstein, a fief subordinate to the Holy Roman Empire, while Schleswig remained a Danish fief. Following the French Revolutionary Wars, the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved in 1806 and the German Confederation formed in 1815 by the Conference of Vienna. See the, uh, the Congress of Vienna, sorry, the Congress of Vienna, we see a picture of it here, also included Holstein with the Danish king becoming a federal prince. Now this construction worked well in the feudal system, but was not compatible with the concept of a nation based on the idea of a homogeneous group of people sharing history, culture, language, religion, and values, living on a defined territory over a long period of time. The paradigm of the national state required a congruence between personal and national identity and offered only one choice of nationality, a clear statement of belonging either to one group or the other. Danish-minded, German-minded, Frisian-minded and others soon engaged in a debate about the future of Schleswig and Holstein in the era of national states. This debate was complicated by the fact that, according to the Treaty of Rebe from 1460s, the Dutchies should never be divided. The arguments in this debate were often based on definitions of linguistic, cultural, or historical borders and maps played an important role, uh, role in this argument. That marking national borders in such a diverse region proved difficult. And the dispute got heated up until between 1848 and 1851, several parties engaged in a civil war over the question whether Schleswig and Holstein should be tied closer to Denmark or the German Federation, Federation, Confederation. So you see a few pictures from this conflict here. And at the end of the war in 1851, um, the so-called London Protocol, when they later re-established the statutes before 1848, meaning Schleswig and Holstein were still fiefs the Danish king. This construction was a bit outdated by the time, and when the Danish government pressed the Danish king to tie Schleswig and Holstein closer to Denmark in 1863, Prussian Chancellor Bismarck regarded this as a violation of the Lund Protocol and the cause for war. Under the so called Second Schleswig War, Prussian and Austrian troops defeated Danish forces in 1864, afterwards placing the duchies under a joint Prussian-Austrian administration. A few pictures here from this war, a few photographs, one of the first uh, wars that was um, photographed. And on the upper left-hand side is the Danish well-known um, painting, the retreat of the Danish troops. And on the right hand side is a well known German painting, the victory of German troops at the, I guess it's the Dubbel Two years later, two years after the war had ended, Prussia won another war, this time over Austria in 1866, and both Schleswig and Holstein were now merged into the Prussian province of Schleswig Holstein. You see it here on the map of this province on the left hand side of the slide in the middle there's the um what is it the, the coat of arms and on the right hand side um, there's a Danish map showing the Danish perspective. Um, from a Danish perspective, Schleswig, the Duchy of Schleswig um form or part of uh, a Danish sphere of influence, let's uh, say 
um, it was called Sönder Yilin, south of Jutland. From a Prussian perspective, the Danish-speaking, Danish-minded part of the population was now regarded as a minority and the so-called Schleswig-Holstein question as a minority problem, threatening the integrity and security of Prussia and later onwards the German Empire. The perception of the Schleswig-Holstein question as a threat was based on border fear, the fear of losing claim over territory and border in case that the actual situation in parts of the border region would not correspond to the national paradigm of the homogeneous German population. The multilayered conflict in the Dutch East was now reduced to the antagonism of Germanness versus Danishness. This fear of losing claim over territory and border motivated the Prussian administration to suppress Danishness and support Germanness by focusing on a cultural Prussification and linguistic Germanization. To achieve this goal, a variety of pro-German associations and committees were supported. German declared a sole official language, the use of the Danish language discouraged, and the Danish flag banned from flying. Actually, Prussian diplomats had included the possibility of a plebiscite in the border region in the Peace of Prague Treaty, 1866, that ended the Russian-Austrian War, as a possible solution for the border question, but this option was declared null and void in a later treaty with Austria, with the Prussian government opting for Prussification Prus and Germanization of the border region instead. But this um, possibility of a plebiscite was not forgotten and done back then. To mark the claim over the territory of both Schleswig and Holstein, one of the biggest monuments of the German Empire was erected on the Niesberg, close to Aubenra in uh, what is now Denmark, displaying, not surprisingly, the statue of Bismarck, the chosen totem of the German Empire. Now, the strong stance the Prussian-German government took over the German-Danish border issue can also be connected with the notion that the ability of defining borders was regarded as a hallmark of great powers. Prussia's rise to power was closely connected with changes in borders. This marks policy at abandoning hard borders between the German states while simultaneously enlarging the borders of the future um, German Empire um, was the main idea behind the formation of the um, German Empire. Wars with Denmark, Austria and France resulted in border shifts in favor of Prussia, respectively the German Empire. The funding myth of Prussia and the Prussia, Prussian German Empire was based on the idea of a humble small state, Prussia, expanding its borders, finally facilitating the funding of the German Empire by military discipline, ruthlessness, austerity and shrewd diplomacy. During the Congress of Berlin in the 1880s and subsequent conferences, Bismarck strove to earn the reputation as a honest broker in border disputes between European powers. Yet before long, such policies, policy was abandoned in favor of colonial expansion and imperial ambitions. By acquiring a number of colonies and overseas territories, the German Empire stretched its borders beyond Europe and about of nevalism set eyes on the final frontier, the sea. Predictably, such a policy was not without risks. When the First World War broke out, a generation of officers and soldiers, politicians and diplomats who had been raised and trained according to the myth of Prussia's heroic rise to power set out to prove their mettle. During the First World War, German borders remained largely intact, with the fronts running mostly over Belgian and French territory in the west, Russian territory in the east, where the German army established the occupation regime of Oberost, as it was called, regarded by General Ludendorff as the springboard for a German empire in the east, with the Baltic as a breeding ground for future soldiers. 
Yet in autumn 1918, Ludendorff had to inform the Kaiser that Germany was actually losing the war. And when the armistice came into effect on the 11th of uh, November 1918, the Western Front was still running through Belgium and France, while German troops were still under arms in Eastern Europe. The widespread unwillingness to accept the defeat and face reality gave rise to so-called step in the back, Deutschlandslegende, step in the back move in Germany that blamed the loss of war and treacherous forces outside the battlefield. Even the German delegation at the Paris Peace Conference, we see a photograph here, felt so uneasy in representing a country that had lost the war with almost no power of negotiation at their hands that they further reduced their space for diplomatic maneuvers by clinging to the diplomatic tactics of Prussian German Machtpolitik, power politics, attempting to exercise pressure on smaller states and to negotiate on equal terms with the great powers that had won the war. Yet the delegation's unrealistic assessment of the situation and self-opinionated behavior annoyed the allied negotiators, including President Wilson, whom the German delegation lectured about the concept of a just peace, a term that Wilson had formed himself. And finally convinced the Allied negotiators that the German side failed to accept the loss of war. The territorial changes resulting from the Paris Peace Treaty, the withdrawing of borders, and particularly the plebiscites and the borders between Germany and Poland, and Germany and Denmark, the part of this treaty, were resented by the German negotiators, government, and large parts of the public. German diplomats harbored a deep dislike for internationally guaranteed plebiscites, since these would give them no chance of negotiating borders, exercising diplomatic pressure. This was particularly the case with the Danish-German border. Diplomatic relations between Denmark and Russia-Germany had been characterized by a highly asymmetrical relation of power. Even though Denmark, like its Scandinavian neighbors, had remained neutral during the war, the Danish government had to make concessions to the big neighbor in the south. And at the Paris Peace Conference, the German delegation, led by Secretary of State Rockdorf Ransau, furiously tried to avoid an internationally guaranteed plebiscite on the border between Denmark and Germany attempting to reach a bilateral agreement until the last minute. Now, in this context, border fear can be understood as a fear of losing control over borders that motivated German diplomats to cling to the diplomatic tactics of Prussian German power politics, behavior that further limited the space for negotiation at the parents' peace conference. The Danish diplomats, in contrast, showed a more realistic grasp of, grasp of the situation, representing a small state. They were used to navigating the currents of great power struggles and pursuing the interests of their country. Actually, the German-Danish border dispute was also of special interest to Bratdorf Ransau, the leader of the delegation and German Secretary of State, who was born in Schleswig and had served as German envoy to Denmark from 1912 to 1918 before being promoted to the post of German Secretary of State. And as envoy to Denmark, Robert Ranzo had kept a tight hand on the Danish press during the war, subjecting the border dispute to strict censorship. Things changed in the summer of 1918 when Allied victory seemed at hand and the border question became a front page topic in Danish newspapers. Facing the loss of war and upcoming peace negotiations, Rockdorf Ransau changed his course in October 1918, now suggesting to solve the dispute on the bilateral level by granting a plebiscite to Denmark. Yet the Danish parliament refused to engage in such negotiations in favor of maintaining a strictly neutral position, keeping focused and the goal of reaching an internationally guaranteed level seat over the German-Danish border at the Paris Peace Conference. Moreover, the fact that Prussia had once included the option for a plebiscite in the Prague 
peace treaty, later annulling this option did not foster the image of Prussia and Germany as a reliable negotiation partner in this issue. Before leaving Copenhagen to become Secretary of State in Berlin, Dr. Ramsau announced in an interview with the Danish newspaper to aim for a just peace based on Wilson's 14 points at the Paris Peace Conference, but did not mention a plebiscite about the border any longer. At the same time, the Prussian administration in Schleswig-Holstein stuck to their strict position in the language question and kept on regarding German as the only official language in the border region, even after the ceasefire after the end of the war. In response, Danish ambassadors in the allied countries now campaigned for making internationally guaranteed plebiscite part of the peace treaty, while a Danish delegation traveled to Paris successfully lobbying the issue at the peace conference. As Secretary of State, Brockdorf Ransoff felt uncomfortable and humiliated by the idea of having to accept the terms of the peace conference. Regarding the German-Danish border, he still favored a bilateral agreement over a plebiscite. On the 5th of April 1919, he let himself rip under talk with a Danish envoy in Berlin, Karl Moltke. Karl Moltke. And we see here on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, the Wilhelmstraße in Berlin, in the, from our perspective, on the right-hand side of the street, is the German foreign office. In the center of the slide, uh, that's a painting of Brockdorf of Ransau by Max Liebermann on the right hand side of the slide. That's Karl Moltke, the Danish envoy to Berlin later on um, promoted to become Danish Secretary of State. And as said in his talk uh, with Karl Moltke, Brockdorf Ransau and Pre he expressed himself rather freely, declaring that the Danish side would act like Vienna's, as he said, by accepting the terms of the commission that designed the plebiscite at the peace conference. And I now quote his words. Despite this, they, the Danes, would find themselves in a grave error. We, the Germans, are not dead yet, and the people of 70 million cannot be destroyed. They, the Danes, have decided to accept German territory from the hands of the intent. I should like to warn against such Danaan gift and confront the Count Moltke today with the honest question of how long Denmark thinks they can keep this gift. Unquote. In a speech to the German National Assembly later in April, Brock of Ramsau took a similar position. Yet the Allied negotiators remained unimpressed and included internationally guaranteed plebiscite in the peace treaty. Facing a plebiscite over the border, the German Foreign Office commissioned a pro-German propaganda campaign and supported pro-German committees and associations in the border region, which actually proved a difficult task since these groups were engaged in rivalries working against each other, as one official noted. Most German newspapers covering the issue subscribed to the view of the German Foreign Office and considered an international plebiscite as more or less unlawful. Quite often, diplomats, politicians, pro-German activists and journalists even shared a rather toxic language, frequently referring to a plebiscite as rape of Schleswig. Same case, by the way, um, the uh, plebiscite in Schlesien. The plebiscite was held in spring 1920, and resulted in the border still existing today. Here's a very nice map from colleagues of the University of Kiel. The result was not too bad for Germany, since the trade hub of the region, Flensburg, remained on the German side of the border. Yet even as late as June 1920, the German envoy to Denmark, Dr. Ramsau's uh, successor, I suppose, made an unsuccessful last attempt at convincing the Danish government to negotiate uh, the actual border between Denmark and Germany. Soon after, the Allied Council, Council of Ambassadors in Paris drafted the border. At the beginning of July, sovereignty over the regained area was transferred to Denmark in the French Foreign Ministry. So now, summing up the German-Danish border dispute, one might 
ask um, why all this fuss? Why was this Danish-German border so important to Germany? Actually, the shifting of the border was not connected to any strategic question. In the loss of territory, population, and economy, small in comparison to the territory, population, and economy that Germany had to cede to France and Poland after the war. Yet the question of how the border was defined was a question of prestige. Germany resented and rejected the internationally guaranteed plebiscites included in the Paris Peace Treaty, whether these plebiscites resulted in a shift of German borders, as was the case for the plebiscite in Upper Silesia and East Prussia or Schleswig, or not, as was the case with the plebiscite on the island, Orland Islands, that was also rejected by Germany. Apart from the loss of territory, population and economy, the plebiscites were regarded as signifiers for the loss of military and diplomatic power, and were connected to this uh, Treaty of Shame. With a strong British presence in the Baltic Sea just after the war, the German government feared a lasting British influence in the Baltic Sea region. Yet Great Britain's main goal was not enlarging their sphere of influence, but establishing a balance of power between Russia, France and Germany. From this perspective, British diplomats discouraged, for example, Swedish-Finnish attempts at establishing a coalition of Poland and the Baltic stage, just as the German counterparts did. Another shared interest was the containment of Bolshevism and the, ally, uh, and the Allies commissioned German troops and militias to remain in the Baltics until the Allied and national troops took over. When the situation had been more or less stabilized in 1921, Great Britain removed the ships from the Baltic Sea. Germany now established closer relations with the newly funded USSR, just, just for the bigger picture, so to speak. Still, Many Germans kept on resenting the Paris Peace Treaty as a treaty of shame and an injustice of fate or the result of a step in the back by treacherous forces. The legacy of the revan revanchist rhetoric of regaining territories and reshifting borders that had emerged as early as 1918 under the debates of a possible plebiscite in Schleswig, Upper Slesia and East Prussia proved toxic. Revanchist daydreams about regaining spatial, political, and historical greatness were soon linked with folkish ideology and rhetorics later being merged into national socialist propaganda. So to sum it up, I should say border fears, uh, the state here is fears of losing claim over border, of control over border, um, can have a high psychological and political impact over years and decades especially when connected to nationalist uh, rhetorics and politics. So far from my side, thank you very much for um, listening to this for almost half an hour. And I'll now stop the Bildschirm Nutzung. Yes, okay. uh, thank you very much for, for your uh, let's say your time discipline so 20 to 30 minutes uh, you you did it 25 minutes in the middle thank you so much um well uh, first of all uh, i would propose that we open the floor to uh, the participants and uh, the audience uh, for questions remarks uh, comments and if uh, in the first turn there are, there is nothing like that, I, I would have a couple of questions, of course, but I, I don't want to be the first one to to ask you. So uh, now uh, we open the discussion uh, in Polish or in English, because we have this uh, translation opportunity. You can choose your channel at the bottom of the window. Uh, does anybody? Uh, wants to uh, ask something uh, with regard to the presentation we have uh, listened to for the past 25 minutes. I, just, I see a oh. hand uh, here raised by. Yes, uh, I, I would be happy if I could see. I this, see two hands hand. now one by Jörg Hackmann, another one by Pavel. Mikalski, 
Yes, yes, yes. Oh, uh, it's fine. You see the hands. Uh, I can. Oh, okay. It's okay. I, I, I'm. I know where to to watch now. So uh, I'm not able to tell you right now. Uh, sorry for my two colleagues who was the first one. So let's do it alphabetically. So I propose that Professor Jörg Hackmann uh, starts with his question, remark, or comment, and then uh, it will be the turn of uh, Babel Migdalski. Okay. So. Uh, Please. Uh, yeah, please all right. Please uh, let's, uh, then I'll start. Yeah, thank you very much for this interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and apologies uh, that I could not. I'm sorry, I, I, can, I can't hear you. Oh, you should. I don't know whether it's a problem my side or the computer. Uh, well, okay. uh, I can yeah. hear uh, Professor Hackman at least. I oh, I have... couldn't. It's, oh, it's, maybe uh, it's no, uh, issue with your. Oh, one. Oh. Maybe you have yes. So I'm talking. So um, in order to make some sound. Yes, thank you. I, it was the, uh, the, the I still was on English translation. So oh, okay. So no there's problem. no English translation. Okay, everything. Uh, what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. And apologies uh, that I uh, could not uh, listen right from the beginning. Uh, so uh, and if I repeat things you said, then. Um, once again, apologies. So, uh, yeah, but uh, I think the so your um, uh, paper, of course, is uh, of broader interest for the, let's say, uh, large parts of the Baltic Sea region. And uh, so, and uh, there's a, uh, I have a PhD, uh, PhD student in Greifswald doing with, uh, dealing with East Prussia, actually, at this period. And so one thing he is focusing on is, let's say, the, uh, mm, role of civil society, so not only of diplomacy, but so how, let's say, um, German associations or networks uh, formed or became active in order to prevent uh, border changes or to, let's say, got even control of the process uh, of uh, giving away uh, German territory. So the, my question would be, of course, we know this was uh, the Grenzverein then afterwards, but the question would my question, interest would be, so how important were these groups already, in, let's say, right after the war, in the Danish case? And uh, the second thing, um, I forgot that, right? No, maybe so. <laughs> okay, so let's leave it with the uh, civil society. No, yes. uh, the second point, now I have it. So it's a question, uh, let's say, uh, how long the conflict or the uh, was hot uh, on the Danish bo um, German border. So, if you look at, let's say, the German Polish border, you could say that it actually remained hot more or less all over the time, of course, or with some ups and downs and a little bit controlled after 1934. But so, my impression is that the um, German Danish conflict somehow fades away from the German public, at least, or from the even these uh, uh, revisionist uh, historians. So since the mid 1920s, actually, when it rather increased in relevance uh, in the German Polish case. Yeah, thank you. Yes, well, thank I, you. I, I propose that uh, maybe you you answer uh, directly uh, the, yeah. the question. We, we we had not no no bunch of questions so far. Maybe we mm -hmm. have further in the conference. We'll see. But right now you can answer. Directly. I can do so. Yes, the first question on the on the civil society, let's say, on these organizations, there were a lot of organizations um, claiming to support the, the German uh, cause, looking into the archives and, and of the German Foreign Office, the Politisches Archiv des Auswärtigen Amt, the, um, the, 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 um, docu there, are, there are a lot of documents from these um, Institutions, uh, they were meeting uh, in each sm small village in the, in the uh, local inn at the Gasthof, sending telegrams to the foreign office. Yes, we support the Danish, uh, the German cause and claim this and that. But, um, the foreign office was a bit where they, they would like, they, 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 they aimed at supporting these um, groups, but this was a bit difficult and they were a bit reluctant. This was also rooted in the experience of the First World War when at the beginning of the First World War there were a lot of these pro-German activists who 
um, engaged in pro-German propaganda on their own, but this was nothing the Foreign Office was really um, happy about because uh, they lost the control a bit of, uh, of the, of the um, of public relations of propaganda. And there was a similar thing, thing here at the end of the war when again there were these groups who planned to support the, the German uh, cause, um, often disliking each other and so on. Um, the diplomats at the Foreign Office tried to, to keep an overview about who was who and the Danish, uh, the German um, envoy to Berlin often sent telegrams to the Foreign Office and say, okay, now this and this delegation is coming to the Foreign Office they would like to meet. It's not recommended that they should be um, met or so because they are a bit difficult. And other ones, um, yes, um, they 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 were supported. And the conflict is uh, uh, that answer the question or? Yeah, of course we could continue. Maybe uh, yeah. just one follow up because. Um, Let's say in the case with East Prussia, so there were a lot of, let's say, intermediary organizations. So let's say where it's difficult to tell. So whether these were some official institutions um, uh, or not. So definitely they were not only, let's say, NGOs, but let's say government uh, financed um, NGOs. And the idea uh, um, obviously was, let's say, uh, to have some channels how to, um, give money but um, maintain control so not just giving yeah. let's say to some people directly or some associations but uh, we are some organizations that could then somehow monitor what's going on the same uh, uh, in the Danish German border region but they said there were also a lot of just loose associations people gathering together at the local inn forming a group sending a telegram claiming we are the so group so and so and that was that um, uh, so um, there was a wide variety of um, organizations or groups uh, claiming to support the German uh, cause. Let's say the those were just once off uh, meeting more or less, and the other ones uh, were maybe already engaged in propaganda or other activities in the First World War, and now uh, uh, kept on supporting this cause. But it's just, yes, it's 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 like with Poland. It's a it's a big topic, I think, uh, and a lot of groups here. And the second one, it remained hot, I should say, until uh, well, the finally uh, nine, until 1955, maybe. Uh, this is a bit a question of perspective, maybe. Uh, for me, I uh, focus on the Danish-German border uh, issue, and from my perspective, the mm, this remained a topic or became a remained a topic of uh, revanchist um, uh, narratives until uh, from 1900 until 1945 so to speak um, I can't really compare with the Polish example because I don't have too much knowledge about that in, to, to be able to can really compare that but I guess most of this region where the where there were border conflicts, um, there were 1920s, 1930s, a lot of early followers of National Socialism, maybe, and that was at least the case here in in the um, province of Schleswig-Holstein. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, if you allow, uh, Pierre, uh, just a short follow-up. Um, of course, so, of course. Uh, one way how to... Um, Follow that would be um, if you look at these uh, folks and culture board activities uh, emerging. Let's say you know, I think in the early twenties, and there at least in the first stage when these were still uh, coordinated from Leipzig. So the north, in the case, uh, so in the sense of Denmark, uh, German Danish uh, border regions were still relevant. But then actually from the late nineteen twenties and when it was then taken over by Berlin, uh, so actually so these these uh, danish uh, german danish issues somehow disappeared so they maybe they were somewhere in the background but definitely no longer um, dominating and not at the same level as all the questions uh, connected to eastern europe 
Okay, yes, thanks for the suggestion. So that's a good uh, way of looking closer into this uh, topic. Okay, so uh, now, uh, Pavel, uh, it's your turn. Then we will have another uh, question or comment by uh, Mr. German Ragozi. Za serdecznie dziękuję za bardzo ciekawe przedstawienie tematu, który był od wielu lat dla mnie bardzo interesujący. Miałem przyjemność przed kilku laty badać problem, nazwijmy to polityki historycznej związaną, związanej z słowiańską przeszłością tego rejonu pogranicza duńsko-niemieckiego, gdyż we wczesnym średniowieczu teren aż po kilonie w Agrie zamieszkiwały plemiona słowiańskie. I ten element, przynajmniej z, jak wynika także gdzieś tam z moich badań, był dość ważnym, przynajmniej dla niektórych środowisk, elementem dyskusji niemiecko-duńskiej, nacjonalistycznej od połowy XIX wieku, kiedy ten element nacjonalizacji się zdecydowanie bardziej tam rozwinął na tych terenach i doszło do dwóch konfliktów o, o Szlezwik, o których dzisiaj była mowa. Natomiast dla mnie jest to też bardzo ciekawe, że to znaczy troszeczkę odwołując tego, co przed chwilą zostało powiedziane, ewidentnie tutaj strona duńska wykorzystywała ten element słowiańskiej legendy, aby umniejszyć znaczenie strony niemieckiej, aby pokazać siłę ponad Niemcami. I to nie tylko w okresie tego sporu w okolicach I wojny światowej i plebiscytu, ale także po II wojnie światowej. To jest bardzo ciekawe. Pokazywano zwycięstwo nad Słowianami na przykład w bitwie pod Lerskow z roku 1943. To było podczas II wojny światowej w rocznicę okrągłą tej bitwy i tuż po II wojnie światowej, ażeby pokazać, że dzisiaj tak samo będziemy silniejsi niż nasz partner z południa, partner niemiecki. I to bardzo ciekawe, takie wątki wychodziły zwłaszcza z grup związanych, tak jak profesor Hackman pytał o, o, o o stowarzyszenia, NGOsy, tutaj o związek Duńczyków w północnym, w południowym, przepraszam, Szlezwiku oraz o grupy związane wokół czasopisma Tyras Volt. Także między innymi taki dziennikarz Tage Mortensen wskazywał tutaj jednoznacznie, że na przykładzie słowiańskim potęgę Danii, umocniania się tej granicy duńskiej. Tylko takie refleksje, które celem uzupełnienia bardzo ciekawego pańskiego referatu, no i myślę, że te, te, te wątki są bardzo, myślę, no można powiedzieć ciekawe, gdyż tu no, wspomnienie też sprawy polskiej. Wydaje mi się, że po I wojnie światowej w duńskiej historiografii, nie mówię o propagandzie w całości, ale głównie o historiografii, mamy wyciszenie wątków y, antyniemieckich, przynajmniej jeżeli chodzi o badania mediewistyczne, wczesno-średniowieczne, w przeciwieństwie do Polski, gdzie mamy wręcz wzmożenie badań, Anty, może nie, antyniemieckich de facto, ale mówiących o wczesnym średniowieczu po I wojnie światowej. Zwłaszcza w ośrodku poznańskim, w szkole archeologicznej Józefa Koszczewskiego i, i, i historycznej Józefa Kazimierza Tymienieckiego, podczas gdy w Danii następuje na pewien moment taki zwrot, odwrócenie się od tych czasów wczesnego średniowiecza. No to jest oczywiście tam z różnych przyczyn, to można, można by było rozwijać, ale myślę, że, tak, że tutaj pewne podobieństwa, ale różnice są też zauważalne, mimo że wydawałoby się, że problemy tej płonącej granicy, tak tej wielkopolskiej czy pomorskiej, jak i między duńskim i niemieckim Szlezwikiem byłyby by zbliżone, ale jednak niektóre elementy są dość różne. To tylko tak celem uzupełnienia i zwrócenia uwagi na ten problem bardzo ciekawy, no, można powiedzieć, odbijał się w różnych sferach. To dziękuję. Dziękuję, Pawle. Czyli to był drogą komentarza, tak uzupełniającego o perspektywie słowiańską, polską również, tego obszaru no, wielokulturowego w dawniejszych czasach, że tak powiem. Ehm, dziękuję. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ragozin, uh, you have a question, it seems to me, because I see this blue hand. So feel free to ask. Uh, dear uh, Professor Ziegelke, thank you very much for your uh, for an interesting presentation. Uh, also, for the refreshing the, uh, this uh, uh, topic, which uh, for the first uh, time seems to be a closed one, so 
problem and the folder which is already in the archive. Uh, uh, and since I have been uh, uh, dealing with the, uh, I have been dealing with the ideological, <laughs> uh, with, with the ideological perception of the uh, border conflicts uh, during the emergence of uh, German national state in my PhD thesis. Uh, for me, it was uh, interesting partly to refresh the older thing, uh, the thing I used to work with uh, several years ago. Uh, though my question is not that connected with it. It is connected with um, uh, with the outcomes of that um, of that discussion. Uh, of that dispute. So how it became possible in your mind uh, that such kind of border fear uh, evolved into one of the uh, into into one of the success stories of the interregional corporate and cross-border cooperation in Europe. So how it became possible to uh, uh, to deconstruct de how how does it uh, how does it all um, historical policy or historical memory you know, on both sides of the Danish German border? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Unfortunately, just a, just a question. Sorry, yeah. a question to to uh, Mr. Zigelke. Uh, uh, you got it all because uh, from my part, sometimes there was a, a small uh, perturbation in the sound uh, coming from. It was uh, a bit garbled, uh, yes. But uh, the end. But the, guess, the question is clear. Okay. I, I think so. Yes. Okay. Um, I think the main one of the main points is money. Uh, after uh, the end of the Second World War. Um, when both Germany and Denmark became parts of the the, um, the European project that finally led to the European Union, this region, uh, this EU region, so to speak, the Danish-German one, um, um, had a lot of EU money at their disposal. So... Um, Actually, now there, there, there's no real need to, to struggle over, over, uh, funds also to, because there, are, there are enough funds from the outside. No, um, I, well, I mean, the, the first, the second world war was also such a big, big topic in the, um, the German um, occupation of Denmark was such a big topic, such a trauma, such a shock uh, to Denmark that maybe this earlier uh, uh, dispute from a Danish perspective, um, or from a, from the, the Danish um, German relationships, didn't play such a big role anymore. I mean, after just after the Second World War. There were other problems at hand, uh, a lot of refugees between Germany and Denmark in the border region, one million people being more or less stranded there. So there were, was need for active cooperation. And um, it might be that this rather um, pragmatic approach of politics after the Second World War and the integration into the European Union um, fostered the, the cooperation. But of course, there's still nationalists on both sides. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's clear. I mean, um, so okay. the narratives are still, narratives are still then. Thank you. So, uh, in your mind, uh, uh, has the shift in historical memory also happened? So, uh, shifting the uh, emphasis from the um, from the um, some kind of, from some kind of military myth, uh, from some kind of uh, Prussian myth to a myth of uh, to or, or to or to analyzing the neighborhood overall and uh, understanding uh, each other as neighbors uh, sharing the same problems. 
and say nation to solve. Well, there was, it's a, it's a bit difficult to talk about identities, but uh, there was some, some, some experience in this border region already as early in the 16th, 17th, 18th century before the rise of the national paradigm, so to speak, when uh, the people in this region sometimes uh, had to flee from um, uh, the members of the, 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 the military of the Danish king who wanted to catch them uh, and forced them into the Danish forces and then again they had to flee because someone from the south was coming etc for example in, in the the islands um, that was the case like Zult or Amrum or so um, yeah it's, I mean Just now, I think that after after the Second World War, yes, this this pragmatic approach uh, um, um, is most accepted because, uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, I uh, would like to uh, tell you that we we could have also a look at the chat, and there are two questions. I will yes. read them together. And then there will be uh, also a question by uh, Dr. Akansha Singh, one of our participants. So I, th I think we have we have time to to go through all of them, uh, at least with some quick statement about it. Well, uh, as you can see, the <clears throat> first question is from the um, Danish perspective. Did Danish political parties uh, speak with one voice regarding the plebiscite and the territorial scope of the plebiscite? That's one question. The second one is from the German perspective, rather as in your paper. So are we able to determine what was the main impulse for the process of widely understood Germanization of the lands in Schleswig and Holstein? Were the actions taken by the Germans mainly the result of the population's fear of losing their lands? Or did they have their source strictly in politics? So I propose you to maybe give some answer to those two questions. And then uh, I would uh, ask uh, Mrs. Akansha uh, to ask her question. Oh, I see also Mr. Nitu. Okay, let's see how we are about uh, the time left. So the floor is yours again, Mr. Sigurd. Yes, regarding the first one, I have to confess, I don't know. I would guess so, but I it, it, I mean, they, there were a lot, I mean, I don't know, I, haven't, I don't know, for example, what the, the extreme leftist parties also um, uh, said, so I'm afraid I can't really answer this one, but my guess would be uh, yes. I mean, um, the plebiscite was obviously the the best option by now is regarded as a, as a model solution for for solving such a border issue. And I would be surprised if any party in 1920 in Denmark would uh, oppose such a um, plebiscite. Actually. Regarding the plebiscite, there was also one main point of discussion between Germany and Denmark was um, how the plebiscite would take place. Even um, uh, one level was plebiscite, yes or not, and the other was um, how this plebiscite uh, should be implemented. And this was also uh, a debate, for example, how the... Um, uh, this plebiscite was held in two areas, formerly three areas were designed. And the question, so often is the case with uh, plebiscites and um, votes, etc., was how to draft the, the, the areas of the, the vote. So there might have been some discussions about that topic, but I just have to say I have not made a study of the, the uh, views of the, the all the Danish political parties, I'm afraid I can't really answer that one. The second one is... The second one was about the German motivation. Yeah, I just I just read it here. It's, it's, it's a longer okay. one. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's with a comment, yeah? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a top-down process, basically, yes. This is uh, um, said in the border region. Um, there were... It was the case that in one family, uh, people were, some of them were uh, uh, regarded as Danish and the other ones as German. And then there were those who were uh, born, uh, had, a, had a 
German passports, the, the parents were Dutch, and so on and so on. So um, there were uh, uh, activists uh, on the local level, but the this real toxic uh, aspect of uh, the whole dispute that came from the outside, I should say. Okay. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, now uh, this next question, you have two two uh, questions. So, Mrs. Akanksha Singh and then Chipriyan Nitu, uh, both participants of our <coughs> of a conference. Yes, so, hi. Hello. Uh, that was a very informative lecture, especially for me, because uh, uh, my expertise is not in, you know, very historical perspective. I don't have so, so much of detail. So my area is basically uh, Baltic states. I've uh, worked on Baltic states in my PhD. And I was just thinking if you could throw some light uh, of uh, German and Baltic relations, Baltic states relation over border during uh, the timeline which you have mentioned in your presentation. I would like to know the their status uh, according to you, according to the historical perspective, what was actually going on. You know that German uh, rule was ended in 1939 uh, with this Molto of uh, Pact. So, and you know, I will highly appreciate it if you could throw some light for my knowledge. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Should I just answer a uh, question to the yes. moderator? Yes. Yes, yes okay. I think it yes, is. Um, German, the board mentioned that the, the, the military um, leadership of the German uh, army had this, this dreams of expanding to the east uh, uh, and regarding this as a kind of springboard to expand their sphere of influence until northern India. They, they had these this dreams actually. And um, yes, Germany promoted uh, the, the independence of the Baltic states promoted the, the independence uh, accept uh, or um, accepted the independence with the idea to to build the kind of uh, uh, buffer states uh, um, not really buffer states let's say that was but uh, that is, um, um, Areas of uh, inf an area of influence, so to, so to speak, they were hoping for or aiming at um, independent Baltic states in a way connected with Germany. It was discussions about how to how this can be achieved to, to tie these uh, states to to Germany without damaging their independence. Um, and this, this this happened after the 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 the, um, the ceasefire, the peace treaty between Germany and Russia, uh, um, in Brest Litovsk, and there was this afterwards there was this vacuum when the the Tsarist Empire almost collapsed. So the Baltic states took advantage of that, and Germany fostered that. And um, yeah, at the end of the war, after the ceasefire. Um, this was a rather hot area, as you know, and um, there were still German troops and militias in this region. Actually, the, the Allies commissioned these uh, German troops and militias to remain in the region uh, until national troops and, and light troops could take over. But this was a difficult thing because some of these militias started to act on their own. Um, and by the end of 1921, then uh, uh, this uh, the, the situation was more or less stabilized, and the, the German troops had to move back to Germany. And, well, some of these militias then spread terror in Germany on 1920, 20 onwards, were used in Germany. So this uh, is it's, it's a thesis, it's a theory that uh, a lot of the military political violence by militias um, that took place in the Weimar Republic um, had their origins in the Baltic uh, uh, states in the sense that these militias uh, trained themselves, so to speak, and were engaged in, in this, uh, the, the first in this rather brutal 
regime uh, of the occupation regime of Oberost and then uh, in this more or less um, not independent but is yeah uh, acting as in this in this difficult situation Did but they're, they're, they're really ex I guess they are really real experts on this uh, on this issue yeah, yeah. here in the conference <laughs> I'm not <laughs> one this is just a brief uh, no, 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 brief no. overview but I think there are other people here who really know about that Thank you so much for your answers. Thank you. Thank you too mm -hmm. for your question. Uh, the uh, last question I see, or at least the last person with a question or comment, is uh, Mr. Uh, Ciprian Mito, is uh, uh, Romania from Romania. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question, but I'm a question, but I'm not sure that it will be adequate. However, as it is. Um, were there in the period analyzed by you, were there an anti-war movements or organized groups that pointed the finger towards the risk of war in the region, groups that expressed their anxieties, their fears, either or Danish or German side as regards the risk of a new war in, uh, in the region? So do you came upon such uh, movements in your research, or do you know about the existence of, of such uh, movements in the in the region? That's a good question. Thank you. I should say, from the German side, there was always this not outspoken threat of military invasion or engagement that was was this the there the was this fear of losing claims over the border and control of the border on the German side and what they did was they created a situation of fear in the border region and uh, tried to uh, yeah um, create fear um, on the other side of the border but I have not come really across uh, really uh, uh, expressions of fears of an actual armed conflict in the region. I have to say this was always something that was somehow implemented in everything, but not really outspoken. Maybe because the situation, the balance was so obvious that uh, the German military was much stronger than the Danish one. In the, uh, Around the First World War. Yes. Uh, with regard to the, to the question that has been asked by a colleague of us, of ours, uh, uh, Dr. Christian Fudarek, uh, as far as the, the unity or the lack of unity of the Danish politicians was concerned, uh, here's a, a comment. You can read it in the in the comment section. According to reports by a British diplomat from Copenhagen. There were differences between the parties. See British documents on foreign affairs. I understand it is kind of a suggestion or an additional comment by Dr. Shudarek. That's what great. Thank you. Yes. I mean, the British uh, documents are, uh, particularly on Scandinavia, are quite good sources and uh, great. So I'll, I'll follow this. Uh, I will uh, just uh, use or enjoy my position as a uh, the organizer, organizer of the of the, the meeting, not uh, wanting to uh, uh, make it longer, we already uh, have uh, almost one hour uh, presentation discussion. But as you see, uh, there were pl plenty of questions, comments. It's a very interesting debate, and one hour is not not enough, almost. So I would be very short. My question would be, uh, well, I don't know whether there is an answer, if there is a point about it, but uh, regarding the uh, events from uh, the first. Uh, uh, half of the 1860s, the Second Slesic War, um, and the participation of Austria, <clears throat> uh, was in, uh, was it a question, was it an issue, or, uh, I know Austria had its, uh, its own problems after 1918, of course, but, uh, was Austria for, for the Danes, for example, was it, a, um, an actor? Was it a point of reference? Was it, um, an element of the game or had it a, a memorial uh, meaning to oppose it to Germans, for example, to make the Germans look 
worse than the Austrians and, and so on, or was it uh, pointless? So it's just um, um, thinking about it. So, so once again, was this is a question on the Danish or the Austrian perspective? Uh, rather on the Danish perspective of the Austrian, uh, of the experience with Austria uh, mm. back uh, half a century before, and was it an element of comparison with with German, uh, German mm, tries to Germanize uh, the region and so on, uh, or for example, uh, was it cultivated as as a, a as a, another form of of, of picture of Germanity that was uh, more acceptable, of course not as a presence, nor as an uh, occupation force, but as something more acceptable than the Prussian, Rush, uh, Prussian German uh, aspect of, of Germanization, militarism mm -hmm. that you can see also in, in, in Slavic countries, in, in uh, Poland, for example. Well, um, uh... Of course, this this image uh, of Prussian militarism, militarism that was the uh, the picture that that was uh, uh, everyone resented, so to speak, uh, that made even things easier to reconcile after the first or second world war. We're saying, okay, now after the end of the first world war, it was possible to say there was a revolution in Germany. Now it's not the Prussian state, but it's a republic we're dealing with. Same after the Second World War. So this image of the Prussian military uh, enemy also had its advantages when uh, after the wars. Um, and from from I'm not quite sure from from what I know this uh, this aspect of this Austrian image of the Austrians. I can't really answer that. It's very interesting, and uh, but I have not been to the Dübel Museum, to the Danish Museum, uh, at the symbolic uh, center of this war so far. Maybe something's uh, uh, there, but um, I have not uh, really come across uh, any any use of the, of a, of a the image of the Austrians as, as you know, uh, something compared with the, with the, with the Prussian. You know, of course, the, it's just curiosity of mine. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, uh, that's and, very interesting. Uh, because you have some uh, have of memory, some Austrian places of memory yeah. on both sides also, so it could be interesting. But uh, I don't want to to abuse my, my position. Uh, there is uh, another comment, but I uh, propose that, uh, in fact, it's a good transition because the, uh, the comment and, and, and maybe question also uh, you have on the on the chat <coughs> a window is by our next uh, participant, uh, Professor Jaroslav Suhoples. So I propose that uh, uh, we keep this uh, intervention by uh, Professor Suhoples for the very beginning uh, of our uh, next uh, session, just after this couple of minutes, 15 minutes maximum, uh, just to uh, enjoy a coffee. And I invite all the participants, so the active participants and the audience, to come back uh, in uh, 10, 15 minutes, clicking on the same link of the first day. Okay? So uh, at uh, 60, uh, at quarter past four, we should meet back here in the room. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Zegelke, for your very uh, interesting presentation. I'm very happy also that uh, this first presentation has. Uh, shown that uh, one hour for every uh, participant is far not too much.